Well, good morning. Technology is wonderful when it works and a challenge when it doesn't. So thankful for you to be here with us physically in the sanctuary. And for those of you who are viewing us online and those of you who are listening to us uh, via Zoom, we thank you for blessing us with your presence as well. A few announcements for your hearing this day, friends. Uh, to our guests, we'd ask that you would do us the kindness of putting guests in the comment section. Simply want to have an opportunity to connect with you a little further. You'll find our connection card will appear in the comment section. It will be pinned there. Please take an opportunity to complete that. For those of you who are guests here in the sanctuary, uh, you have an opportunity to put that URL into your smartphone or tablet. Uh, that'll bring up our connection card. We'd ask that you would take that opportunity to complete that card that we might indeed connect with all of our guests who are joining us in worship this day. Prayer requests can be submitted in the comments for those of you who are online. Uh, for those of you who are here in the sanctuary, uh, you can get those to me via text. The number is there on the screen. Again, if you have a prayer request for those who are joining us online, you can uh, offer that in our comment section. And for those of you uh, who are here in the sanctuary, you can enter that through that cell number that's on your screen. A weekly time of devotion can be viewed each Thursday at 12 noon on our Facebook page. That's every Thursday at 12 noon for our weekly time of devotion. Uh, it's an opportunity during the middle of the week or close to the weekend uh, to get an opportunity for some reflection and some inspiration to uh, either settle your spirits from the hump day experience or to encourage you for the weekend that lies ahead. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up. Better practice, better practice. Uh, Vacation Bible School is going to be the 26th through the 30th, and this year we are uh, being true Methodists in our connectional system, uh, which simply means we are connecting and joining with uh, and using the property at Narden Park United Methodist Church. They've got a large outdoor facility, and so uh, we want to make sure that this was going to be a safe experience uh, for Vacation Bible School. And so Vacation Bible School, again, July 26th through the 30th, 9 to 1030. That's Monday through Friday, Monday through Thursday. Monday through Friday. Friday, thank you. However, we do need some volunteers. If you are interested in volunteering, you can uh, email Pastor B at Pastor B at FarmingtonFUMC.org. Uh, lastly, friends, or well, not lastly, <laughs> we got a three other announcements today. <laughs> uh, Michelle King's commissioning ceremony is going to be uh, streamed uh, on the Michigan Facebook page, Michigan United Methodist Church Facebook page, but also you can find it here. That's going to be at one o'clock. So we ask and invite all of you, those of you who are online with us, those of you who are here, uh, please take an opportunity to either join us here on our Facebook page at one o'clock or the Michigan United Methodist Church's web Facebook page at uh, one o'clock for that commissioning service. It's a great opportunity for us to celebrate with Michelle King this wonderful uh, first step in the journey uh, towards full ordination as a deacon. And it is a wonderful, humbling experience. We remember our ordinations and our commissionings. Well, you, you actually were ordained. I was commissioned uh, many moons ago. So great opportunity for us to celebrate as one community of faith. Uh, lastly, friends want to, well, not lastly, I keep saying lastly. We've got two other announcements. <laughs> phase two of our reopening plan is in effect, friends. We began uh, with phase two of our reopening plan starting the first Sunday in this month of June. And so fully vaccinated persons are not required to wear their masks when they're coming in for worship, uh, along with uh, any committee meetings that want to be held here on site. For those who are not fully vaccinated, either two shots of the Pfizer or the Moderna or one shot of the Johnson & Johnson, uh, we'd ask that you would continue to wear your mask uh, for your safety and for the safety of others. Now, this is actually the last announcement. Uh, we have a few opportunities for service here as a part of our community of faith with our finance team that has done remarkable work over the last 18 months. We celebrated that. Our stewardship team that helps remind us of our good stewardship, not only of our financial resources, but over our physical resources, as Michelle King reminded reminded us it's okay not to be okay. We also have opportunities in our outreach ministry, our trustees, and our streaming team. If any of those sound of interest to you or you want more information, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. That's Pastor Anthony at Farmington FUMC. That's Pastor Anthony at FarmingtonFUMC.org. I'll be happy to talk to you about any and all of these ministry possibilities. With that, friends, we prepare ourselves to move forward into this time of worship with our opening hymn this day. The church is one foundation. The church is one foundation. Let's join together and worship this day, friends.
Good morning, church family. Kindly join me in the opening prayer as printed in the bulletin. God, you call us to go out into the world as your beacons of love, mercy, forgiveness, and joy. When you hear the pleas of a hurting world, you call us to be your hands and feet of healing. Lord, you have not called us to be a perfect example for the world. Rather, you have called us to be authentic, consistent, faith-filled, and faithful servants. Almighty God, empower us, strengthen us, and use us to share your good news. Lord, here we are. Send us. The scripture lesson today is from the book of Revelations, uh, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. and it is the message to Philadelphia. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, these are the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David and who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those of a synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but they are lying. I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word of patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on this world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. If you conquer, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. You will never go out of it. I will write your name, I will write you on the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The word of God for the people of God. God loves me all the time. God loves me all the time. That's really what that scripture just said, sort of. Before I give us a little reflection about how we might understand all that complicated stuff. I do have a celebration that is sort of an another announcement. Guiding Force is going to meet this afternoon at four o'clock in the garden out back. So anyone who is in high school or entering high school in the fall is welcome to join us. They're gonna have a little pizza, something to drink, and make plans, get acquainted, and decide what Guiding Force might look like as we go forward. So please celebrate with us, keep us in prayer this afternoon, and know that we are very excited about this opportunity. So I was thinking about this scripture, I read it early and it went in my head, and, um, and I struggled with it some because it is complicated. I'm sure Pastor Anthony will help us understand it completely but I struggled with it. And then I was, it was running in my head and all of a sudden this little song that has to do with how we open every week came into my head. It's important to understand that this was a difficult time for the church when people were being persecuted for their faith, um, not unlike some things that go on in our lives today, but that's really hard for children to understand and really what this scripture is saying is no matter how hard it gets, God is there. And so the song that went through my head is kind of old, and I don't usually go with old, but, and I won't sing, it's really bad. But I want you, <laughs> and Pat's laughing because she remembers when they turned off my mic at Redford because I was singing. <clears throat> anyway, um, <laughs> See if you recognize this one. 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Christ belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Jesus loves me, this I know, as he loved so long ago, taking children on his knee, saying, let them come to me. Jesus loves me still today, walking with me on my way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. Thou hast bled and died for me, I will henceforth live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Even Revelation. Amen. Thank you, Harvey, as always, for offering us beautiful music for our time of worship. Friends, we've come to this moment of impartation where God can impart to us, speak to us, a word of instruction and encouragement, a word of conviction and restoration as we move forward this day. Allow me to focus our thoughts on this sermon theme, keep the word, keep the word. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask your blessing upon us as we move forward into this time. We open our hearts, minds, and souls to you fully that you might speak to us and plant within us your word. That it will bring much fruit forth that will bless our lives and the lives of those who cross our paths. For indeed, Lord, we want to be faith-filled, faithful followers, consistent and authentic in our expression, that we might be your ambassadors of love and compassion, that we might embody that ethic that Christ offers us to love you with our whole heart, mind, body, and soul, and our neighbors as ourselves, seeking to offer compassion, justice, healing, and wholeness. I now decrease and ask that you would increase, that every word that is uttered, every revelation that is given, will give glory to you. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, and all God's people together said, Amen. My grandfather, in my opinion, was the greatest man that ever lived. And I find myself in situations where I have a picture of him in my office that reminds me that my goal is to be a fraction of the man that he was, to be a quarter of the preacher and theologian that he was. And of the many lessons that my grandfather offered me, one of the most important was what it meant to be a man. 
Now, my grandfather was not from the old guard and old school with outdated understanding. His understanding of manhood was very clear and very simple. He says, a man is one who is character and integrity speaks for him before he opens his mouth. A man is a person whose character and integrity speaks for him before he opens his mouth. One who does not give his time nor energy to fruitless endeavors or conversation and one who honors his word. That if that individual, if that person tells you I'm going to do something, they will do it. Now that was my grandfather's definition of manhood, but I think that's a definition of maturity that we don't give ourselves into fruitless, endless endeavors, that we honor our word, that we don't engage in conversation that tears others down, that we remove ourselves from environments where that is happening in order that we might allow our presence to speak for us before we even open our mouths. When an individual honors their word or their commitment, they have demonstrated dependability and trustworthiness, my grandfather would say. And as people of faith, friends, God wants us to be people of character and integrity, trustworthiness, compassion, authenticity, and in so many ways to mirror the character of God. That's my understanding of what it means to be created in the image of God, that we might liken ourselves to function in the way that God functions, to do as God has showed us, and to be an example to others around us. To act in good faith is what God wants of us so that our partnership with God might transform the world. God has and will always keep God's covenant commitment with us. God continues to deliver us from danger seen and unseen, as the scripture writer would say. God empowers us to transform our lives and equips us to serve others. It's not about us. It's about the next person. For God wants us all to be saved. God wants us all to be in relationship. God wants us all to be made whole and to experience freedom that comes in relationship with God. God plants within our hearts a word of encouragement, conviction, humility, and hope in order to guide and steer us. We as Wesleyans understand that as the prevenient grace or pre-existing grace of God, that little angel on your shoulder that reminds you, now you know you shouldn't do that. Now, you know you might want to say that, but you shouldn't say that. You know you might want to go there, but you are really not supposed to be going there. That, that little reminder of where we ought to go, that direction, that steering. So God wants to bring us, to help us to be consistent, not perfect, friends. For there was only one that was perfect, and we all know how that story ended for Christ. We are those who follow in his example, recognizing that God can do in us immeasurable things when we partner willingly to seek the benefit of others. God plants within our hearts a word, a word of hope, a word of love, a word of compassion. Those words seem to be in short supply nowadays, where we seem to argue and bicker and find ways to make the other the enemy, and we can't figure out what common ground is because if you don't agree with me, there is no common ground. Deep. God pushes us, urges us to honor our commitment to seek that great love ethic and put it into practice. For indeed, God will always honor and fulfill the promises God has made to us in Scripture. And what God in turn asks of us is that we learn and study God's word, that we commit to abide God's word so that we might keep God's word firmly rooted in our hearts. This brings us to point number one, friends. When we keep i.e. nurturing and abiding by God's word firmly rooted in our hearts, it would positively impact and influence our lives. When we keep, that is, nurturing and abiding by God's word firmly rooted in our hearts, it will positively impact and influence our lives. Now, let's be clear, parenthetically, friends, a, a lot has been made of honoring the word of God, and depending on what your theological stance might be, that term has different weightiness. When I talk about keeping the word, I'm talking about that two-line ethic that Christ offers us. Love the Lord, your God, with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. We went into great detail about what it meant to love your neighbor as yourself and took on some the characteristics of what it meant to be compassionate, what it meant to share, what it meant to be someone who was a resource to others, what it meant to be someone who is encouraging and inspiring and, in sport and supportive of someone else. And so we're, when we talk about honoring God's word, we're talking about honoring that Christ ethic that God gives to us. 
For when his disciples asked him, what, what do we need to do? How do we keep all of these commandments? How do we keep all of the ritualistic laws? And, and Christ says, I'm going to boil it down to two. You don't have to remember ten. You don't have to remember the 258 ritualistic laws. You don't have to remember the deviations and the, the uh, loopholes that you, we, you know how we are, are, are as people. We like loopholes because uh, loopholes gives us an opportunity to say, I don't have to do this all the time. He says, I'm going to give you two. Now, these two are very simple, but they're very difficult if you're really trying to live them. Because the first asks you to put nothing above God. Now, that's difficult especially in these days where there's so much that we can put before God and, and we negotiate with God and try to uh, find ways of, of uh, not even trying to find common ground. It's a, it's a way of manipulating God to, that, that allow me to do this, Lord, and I will exchange you doing that for me by doing this minimal thing. And that should be fine. But that's not what God says for us. That's not what Christ says to us. The word all means all. All. The last time I heard the word all meant it, it, it's all-encompassing. It doesn't, need, doesn't leave anything out. So when it says with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, it, it's saying there's nothing left to give anything else if it all goes to God. So that's the first one. That's the difficult one. And then, oh, yeah, Christ did have to throw that second one in there to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Now that is a little stickier. Sometimes I don't really like my neighbor, let alone want to love my neighbor as I would love myself. And if Michelle's sermon reminded us of anything, sometimes I don't even know what it means to love myself. So how can I love someone else? That's the word that Christ is offering us to keep. That's the word that this church in first century Christendom started to keep. That's what this author is admonishing them to do and it's praising them and affirming them for having done. He says, you have kept the word of loving and to being compassionate, of allowing yourself to be fully devoted to God, to share that with others, even in the midst of persecution. For Ephesians 6 and 12 remind us that we don't struggle against flesh and blood, but against dark forces and evil powers in high places that we have an enemy that shows up early and leaves late every day trying to conceive traps and snares to get us to compromise and to give up this love ethic of loving God with all that we have and our neighbors as ourselves. The author of this text, friends, addresses the matter of adhering to and abiding by God's word of love, mercy, and transformation as the author offers this admonishment and this affirmation for the Church of Philadelphia. Now, when we see the word revelation as the scripture reference, most of us get a little fearful and a little intimidating uh, because revelation is, in many Christians' understanding, the last book of the Bible that talks about the end of the world. And so it has these wonderfully creative images that are horrifying if you just read it as if you're reading a novel. However, uh, I'm going to press you a little bit this uh, morning, friends. This, this book is the last book of the Bible, but it is not the last book or God's word. Here's the background. This is written by one who is trying to encourage early Christians who are going through persecution to keep the faith, to keep hold of the world, to stand steadfast, to be faithful and faith-filled. This author never envisioned a world where the Roman Empire would become anything other than a hedonistic culture. Never envisioned Emperor Constantine being converted to Christendom and changing the whole empire to a Christian state. And so when he's talking about the mark of the beast 666, he's talking about the emperor. When he's talking about the world coming to an end, he's talking about it in an immediate term. That's what apocalyptic literature is. Can I teach you a little bit? I'm glad you said yes. Uh, apocalyptic literature is hallmarked by saying an immediate end to the world, not a future end. Because if I'm going through persecution now, why do I care about what's going to happen 2,500 years into the future? I'm suffering now. And so apocalyptic literature by nature talks about an ending of the world that is immediate. Why? Because it encourages those who are being struggling and going through persecution to hold out hope. 
Now, because we've been oriented by our wonderful education system to read a book from cover to cover, meaning that you start with the first chapter, you end with the last chapter, and that's the end of it. And because Revelation talks about the end of the world, we have been ingrained and rooted by many of my colleagues throughout the years that this is talking about the end of the world. But I will remind you one thing that holds and gives me great comfort. Christ says this, no man knows the day or the hour where God will end the world not even me. So friends, I offer this to you just to give you something to think about, to chew on, and to uh, consternate you a little bit just on this Sunday morning, just to give you something to make sure that you're awake and that the coffee's still bubbling in your system. If God would not tell Christ when it's coming to an end, why would God share that with a human being? Just ponder that for a while. We're, we're not going to dwell on that for, for, for too much time, but, but just allow that to percolate in your mind. If revelation is the end of the world and God shares that with a human being but not shares that with the Son who redeems us, that to me is not consistent. So beyond my theological understanding of what revelation represents, Revelation is a message of hope for people who are struggling. Have we been struggling the last 18 months? Are we still trying to navigate our way through this COVID season? Some of us are fully vaccinated. Others of us are questioning vaccination. Some of us still wear masks. Others of us are so anti-max that, that we've never even put one on. Are we going through some difficult situations? How do we hold out hope? Glad you asked that question. The author of Revelation says, keep the word, keep that ethic. Love God with everything that you have and love your neighbor as yourself. Do that, strive to do that each and every day and everything else will fall in line. That's what it means to be a faithful, faith-filled follower of Christ, to live that ethic. So as the author begins to address the church of Philadelphia, he offers the same greeting that he offers the church of Laodicea. Now, Laodicea has a different understanding of what it meant to follow Christ. And, and so while here in Philadelphia, the author of Revelation says, I, I offer you this great greeting because I've heard of your great deeds and your mighty works, and I'm going to affirm you. For Laodicea, he has some critique, some rebuke that, that you are neither hot nor cold. You're neither for God or against God. You're trying to straddle the fence, which makes you lukewarm. And God says to Laodicea, I need you to be consistent, not someone who's trying to figure out who's going to win before you choose a side. But for Philadelphia, he says, you've kept the word. You've kept this ethic. You've kept going with this loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Although you might not be the largest church, although you might not have that many number, although you might not be significantly positioned along a trade route, you still have been consistent in what you have done. This community of believers in Philadelphia have stood against the pressures of persecution, keeping hold of the gospel of Christ. They have held steadfast to the teachings, putting into practice what they have learned to love one another, to love God. Although it came at great personal risk for them, they did not abandon Christ's teachings, which leads us to point number two, keeping the word, i.e. living by and adhering to its tenets amidst struggles, deepens and demonstrates our spiritual maturity. Keeping the word, living by and adhering to its tenets amidst struggles, deepens and demonstrates our spiritual maturity. Now, I understand that I serve a church where there are many seasoned saints, but maturity in faith is not dictated by chronological years. Maturity in faith is dictated by a willingness to grow, to learn, to share, and adhere to that great gift of love God offers us. And that happens most frequently when we have to hold on to it when everything else around us tells us to let it go to hold on to hope, to hold on to love, to hold on to peace when everything around us seems to pull at us, to yank at us, where, where every supervisor and every boss and where every professor and every classmate offers us a reason to, as the seniors and saints that used to say in my grandfather's church, lose my religion. When we hold on to faith, 
Not only does it deepen our faith, but it demonstrates our spiritual maturity because we have the testimony of somebody being able to say, you didn't react the way you used to react. You didn't do the things that you were used to do. When someone cut you off before, I'd have to cover my ears and hope that I did alpha, you know, start to get some of that in my own system. That, that, that you would used to drive, you, road rage was road rage before. It was called road rage when I would drive with you. That you don't demonstrate the same things you used to demonstrate. You're not acting in the same way that you used to act because something different has happened. That's what Christ is calling us towards, to not only deepen our faith, but to demonstrate our faith. Why? You always ask great questions. Because someone is watching, and based on what they see in us, they will say, I can't have trust in God, or I can't have trust in God. I remember my grandfather's words. A person whose character and integrity speaks for them before they open their mouths, has great impact. We talked about the presence of Christ having such a great impact that all he had to do was call those two sets of brothers, come follow me. Didn't give them further explanation, didn't give them great details, just said, come follow me. But his presence was so powerful. Now, friends, we won't have a presence like Christ. That, that's not possible because Christ was fully God and fully human. But what we can do is have such a positive presence that we become that light that others are drawn to. Like many of us know, there's at least one person in your life that every time you see them, you smile because they make you feel good. They don't have to say anything. Some of you married to them. I saw you. There you go. <laughs> make you feel good. Your presence brightens simply by being in their presence, and you look for opportunities just to just rub on them. Let me get some of that. Whatever, whatever it is you got on you, let me rub it off on me. That's what Christ wants of us. That's what this text is calling for us to do, to be that kind of presence to the world so that those who see us see the Christ in us and have strength for themselves. Deep friends, we are all on a journey of maturity, and it's not given to chronologically, it's given to us as we continue to move and deepen our understanding of faith. God urges us to grow and to develop spiritually that we might become the version of ourselves God has envisioned to us. Friends, in all of the books and research that I've studied on church growth, all of it indicates one major factor that pins it all together, that to the degree of a congregation's spiritual growth, their numeric growth will be exponential. Simply put, to the degree that we grow spiritually, we then position ourselves to grow numerically and financially. How do I know that? I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, in Acts, the second chapter, it tells us that when the brothers and sisters got together, reading God's word, praying together, eating with one another, going into the space, developing themselves spiritually, being in community with one another, that God did something miraculous. It says God added to their number Okay, I know at least one or two people in here have read Acts, the second chapter. We've talked about it before. God, God adds to their number, it's an important word, daily. Thank you. God adds to their number daily those who are being saved. Could you imagine what would happen, friends, that if every Sunday our presence was so positive that when people came into this place, they said, I don't ever want to leave, that each and every Sunday, one or three or five or ten families decided to make this community of faith their home. Could you imagine what that's like? I can. That's what I get up with every day. That's the vision that I see happening in this place. That's the goal that I'm striving for, for us to be so impactful, for our presence to be so embarking that each and every Sunday we open the doors, each and every time we connect through our online atmosphere, that someone says, that's a place I want to call my spiritual home. Church growth isn't that difficult, but the formula is hard to implement for it requires us to get free and let loose of our personal preferences in order that we might indeed seek to grow spiritually and seek the benefit of others. This letter to the Church of Philadelphia, friends, reminds us of the importance of learning and living God's word and God's ethic of love for God and love for others. The Church of Philadelphia demonstrates for us that trials and tragedies 
do not need to taint or tear down the weight of our witness, that we, with the help of God, can take small actions and turn them into monumental moments of faith. Although they have, what this author says, little power, i.e. few in number, few in strength, yet you have kept God's word and not denied my name, is what the author of the text says. Which brings us to point number three, friends. Small, consistent steps of faith grow to become huge, towering monuments of faithfulness and transformation. Small, consistent steps of faith grow to become huge, towering monuments of faithfulness and transformation. Transformation in a community of faith is not a blink of an eye kind of moment. That's swelling. Swelling is unnatural. When you see someone having a knot on their head because they've hit their head and they're swelling, the first thing you do is not to say, you know what, that looks good on you. Let's let that knot stay there. First thing you do is you run for the kitchen and you go into the freezer. And if you got peas or a steak, you go that. Or you got ice, you can put it in the bag and you put it on their head or you put it on whatever area is swelling up, maybe your knees, maybe your elbow, so that you might reduce the inflammation, the swelling, because it's not natural. And for a community of faith to want to swell is to say, Lord, we want you to do something unnatural for us that we don't have to work for. Now, growth, on the other hand, takes time, takes small steps, takes little steps. Now, those of you like me throughout this COVID pandemic who've seen uh, your weight fluctuate in the opposite direction of where you want it to go, recognize that the process of which that weight's going to come off is not going to be instantaneous. You're not going to be able to take a pill, wake up, and all of a sudden, bang, you're back down to 195 pounds. I wish. It's going to take consistent steps. Three days a week, going out and walking three miles, going to the gym if you feel comfortable, using some strength training until such time as six months, seven months, eight months, 12 months have come to pass, then you will start seeing the difference. And that's what God is asking for us to do. Take the small steps of faith to see the long lasting transformation that we wanna see. Challenge ourselves, stretch ourselves, strengthen ourselves in ways that in six months time we can see the difference. And friends, I can tell you that indeed there are folks around you who can see the difference that God has made in your life even right now from where you started. The best compliment that a Christian can ever get from someone who has lived with them and seen their life for a long period of time is you no longer act the way you used to act. And the greatest compliment that you could ever say, ever hear, friends, is sometimes feels offensive, but it's a great compliment. If God can do it for you, I know God can do it for me. <laughs> best compliment that you'll ever receive. Don't get bit out of shape when somebody says that, just says absolutely, because you know and I know what I used to be. So if God can do this for me, certainly God can do it for you. Let's walk the journey together. It may seem like small things, friends, but small things come into big things. Christ says to us very clearly, it only takes mustard seed faith, small seed type faith, in order to grow into something that can move a mountain. Friends, when we keep God's word firmly rooted in our hearts, despite our struggles, we demonstrate our Christian character, integrity, grace, compassion, and trustworthiness, and God is able to stretch us and grow us in ways not only that benefit our lives, but the lives of others. So I encourage you this day, keep the word. Continue to grow and to develop in your faith. Continue to allow God to stretch you and challenge you in ways that will make you better to become more of what God wants you to be to be a bigger blessing to the world around us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we come to our moment of offering in the service today, I just want to give those in the sanctuary a reminder that we are, um, you kindly can place your offering in the boxes as you exit. For those of you that are viewing online or through Zoom, you may mail in or drop off a contribution to our address. Our address is 33112 Grand River, Farmington, Michigan, 48336. 
You may use PayPal and direct your contribution to the First United Methodist Church, or you can um, give by texting and text lowercase f-u-m-c, give, g-i-v-e, to 44321 and follow the prompts. If you will kindly pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Pastor Anthony's message, this beautiful space we get to worship in and each other. Help us, Lord, each day to keep your word. We do love you and we struggle. Give us the strength, Lord, to love you and others. We are so grateful each and every day, and we ask humbly that you take these gifts we offer today to use for your glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, we've now come to that time where we are able to come together in this wonderful gift of prayer. There's much for us to be in prayer for. Many of the things that are on your hearts and minds this day, we move forward into this time of prayer. We also have a list of those who have asked us to pray for certain specific situations and people. And so uh, we continue to lift up those who are in the midst of the conflict in Gaza, all of our health care workers, uh, for all of our teachers, many of whom have completed a uh, challenging year thus far, and for those who are still yet uh, to close out rooms or may have yet one more week of school, we continue to lift them up. Along with all of our graduates who, in the midst of a pandemic, sought that they might continue to move forward and to accomplish something wonderful. Yeah, we're looking at you. <laughs> Both of you, thank you for being here, and we indeed celebrate with you that great accomplishment. We continue to lift up those who have various health issues. We lift up Carl Miller, who is recovering from surgery. Uh, Ken Berry, Jim Lanstra, Pat Shuffler, and Paul King, Patty Morrison, Ruth Ewell, Brayton Smith, and Nina Smith. Uh, we lift up Karma Houston and Opal Sherman, John Welch and Arthur Hood, Mildred Tyson and Etna Tyson, Harry Ellis, Nancy Frank, Elizabeth Barton, and Dave Trombley. Continue to keep them in your prayers as they're going through different health issues along with those who continue to deal with COVID-19 and COVID-19 related illnesses. That includes Debbie Betts, Jeremy Murray, Connie Haas's sister Lisa, 
the Cole family, and those who are continuing to battle with various forms of cancer, including Jerry Baum, Sam Johnston, Bill and Marge Johnston, Dottie Bradley, Doug Janord, Thomas Lee, Nellie, and Raina Edwards. And we continue to lift up those families and communities that grieve the loss of those who they've loved, including the Farmington Hills Band community at the loss of Mike Randall, the United Methodist Church in general and here in Michigan in particular for the loss of the Reverend Dr. Wesley West Brunn, for the families of Gerald Smith and Teresa Lanstra, Isla Eckerd, Helen Curry, Olive Lush, Jeremy Cook, Connie Hasta's sister Pam, Kirsten and Ruder, uh, Spencer Ruder, who both lost mother and brother respectively, Angela Turner and Kathy Asima, who lost their mother, and for all who grieve because of tragic means, especially the families of all of the mass shootings that we are unfortunately seeing rise again, for the family of Adam Toledo, Dante Wright, and Officer William Evans. I offer you now, friends, a moment of silent prayer for those names that were lifted and situations that were lifted, along with those that are on your hearts and minds this day, a moment of silent prayer. Come now, Holy Spirit, continue to speak to us God's word of affirmation and encouragement, God's word of comfort and peace. Allow us to look even at the struggles that we find ourselves dealing with as opportunities for God's blessing to be made known. For the word reminds us that God takes all situations, even the bad ones, and transforms them into something that will be a blessing to our lives. So help us, Lord, to see the forest and the trees, that we might move forward with grace and courage, with hope and joy, as we lift those who continue to care for our loved ones, for those who are in nursing facilities and hospitals, all of our healthcare workers, Lord, continue to bless and keep them amidst this time of pandemic and continue to offer them hope and their families hope. Bless and keep all of our members of this community of faith who are in need of your healing touch those who are in various stages of recovery and those who are continuing to battle. Allow them to be inspired and encouraged and allow us to be for them support and hope, reminding them of what you can and always do for us. Provide us hope and peace. And for those who are grieving, Lord, we ask that you would wrap your arms of comfort around them that they might experience a time where the despair and the sorrow in and rejoicing is ahead, knowing that the season of sorrow will not last forever and that we do not rejoice as those who celebrate death, but we rejoice as those who celebrate life eternal. For we know where our loved ones have gone. They now sit at your feet and we will have a chance to see them again. So come Holy Spirit, continue to encourage and inspire us to share your good news with others, O oh Christ, that their lives may be transformed as ours have been. As now we unite our voices in the model prayer that you offer, our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this day, friends, is one of the, my favorite hymns, I Surrender All, I Surrender All.
now, friends, may the grace and love and compassion of God go with you and strengthen you as you dismiss from this place and go out into the world. Take that gift of love and compassion. Share it openly and freely with others that their lives may be so transformed as our lives has been. For you are a blessing from God. Now go be a blessing to someone else. Take care. Have a great week. Be a blessing.